Pop quiz, or I guess pop question. What are three words you'd use to describe your aesthetic? Either the work you make or the stuff you like. I'd be curious if you wrote them down now and maybe after the video it changes or you understand why a bit more. So in order to be careful, let's get a lot of the funny or common ideas about aesthetic out of the way. It could be vaporwave, digitally artifacted pink sunsets with an 80s motif. It could be odd liminal spaces of abandoned malls from the 90s. Or it could be washed out pastel colors surrounded with plant life and accented with gold. It just doesn't have to be at all. At any point or time when someone claims that something is aesthetic or something is their aesthetic, it's because it connects with what feels like their identity or a prevailing undercurrent of mood that speaks to them. Aesthetic is a broad, almost too broad to effectively get anything practical out of subject. So instead of getting lost in the philosophical, let's try and figure out how to make your work give people the value they're looking for. Style is something a lot of people try to figure out for themselves, and as we've talked about a lot before, they usually do so prematurely. What I've always advocated for instead is to find your artistic voice, the thing you're trying to say, instead of just the way that you say them, because style is downstream of voice. Now further downstream from style, you'll find aesthetic. It's a visceral underlayer to something. It's the meaning that's found by the one who observes it. Something being represented in a pixel art style will immediately read as a retro or indie game aesthetic to a lot of people. But the reason for that is their personal connection and memories. Something being in pixel art doesn't inherently mean it's supposed to be video game related. In certain ways, it's impossible for you to excruciatingly control how someone else interprets or finds meaning in your work. But you can guide it, like bumpers in a bowling alley. It's actually super helpful for us to think about aesthetic and how others will interpret your work because it could be the inherent value to them wanting to engage with your work at all. So if someone says something is their aesthetic, it's a sort of aspirational underlayer to the person looking at it, to a point that affects their identity. This could mean other artists want to make work that either looks or feels like yours. Or it could simply be that a fan enjoys or finds meaning in something you made because of how it makes them feel. It could make them want to hang your work up in their space as a sort of ornamental value or as part of the space they're trying to craft for themselves. This includes putting your art on the wall or making it the backdrop on their phone or computer, putting your sticker on something they use every day, or putting a pin of yours on their bag. It could be them creating fan art or work based on your art because it inspired them to do so. Most of us probably want that or see that as a resounding success of our work. So how do we get there? Well, let's talk about six ways that we can raise those bumpers in the bowling alley and maybe even make the lane a little thinner. So for number one at the top, the most potent thing is that artistic voice. It's all the things you're trying to say. That means a reflection of your values, the kind of things that matter and are special to you, and the kind of work or feeling that you want to see more of. It's a little bit like your personal aesthetic, but it doesn't always translate one to one, especially when we're starting out. There's a pretty good example of this leaking through when you don't intend it to, and it's when it's clear that an artist essentially has contempt for the subject matter they're drawing. There will be a dismissive and reducing quality to the work. On the flip side though, something you care a lot about is naturally going to gather like-minded people as fans. Do you love frogs and drawing frogs? You'll likely attract some frog liking people. Do you love nature reclaiming things or man-made buildings and places getting overgrown by foliage? You're going to gather some people that feel the same. It also comes across in practical ways. Are you someone who could care less about the building you're drawing, but will painstakingly craft the foliage that's growing around it? Those plants are going to read either stronger or more important. I think empathy is a quality that character designers do well to have, because often you almost get a feeling for how the artist feels about or connects with the character through the way that they represent them. I think you can tell quite a bit about where an artist's mind was or is in general by looking at something they've made, especially from artists that are more experienced in their field. Now, on the other hand, a feeling I tend to get when looking at beginner's art is an immediate transport back to the time and age when I was figuring things out in art. You can see it in the limited understanding or skill level in the work and the ambition to make something more than they're capable of. 
It's an aesthetic that the beginner can't help but communicate, but it probably is only meaningful in that way to other artists that are more skilled or experienced than them remembering their own time in that range. If you're unsure of your artistic voice, or it feels like it needs to be updated, which everyone should do from time to time, try to figure out the unifying things and patterns across the work that you like and the work that you've made. Try to dig a little deeper on why it is that you like those things, and be plenty personal and honest with yourself. All of that is going to flow downstream into aesthetic. Well, that's at your core and in your mind, so what are some other practical ways to establish aesthetic? For number two, you could be surface level and almost pandering by saying, this one goes out to all the moms out there. Well, hey, I either am a mom or I love my mom. You've now appealed to a particular group and a rather large one at that. But most successful aesthetics, though, allow that message or statement to reside under the surface, almost like a theme. In a film, whether or not a theme is explicitly stated by a character at some point, a good theme in a good film is one that's supported by the rest of the story. If I had a story about a lone race car driver making a trip around the world, and at one point a character said, we'll always be there for you. That's what family's all about. Despite no other part of the story being about family or even the absence of family, it doesn't work as a theme. To impart a theme or value through an aesthetic, it may be more helpful for you to know what you're trying to say but never explicitly saying it. Going back to that nature reclaiming idea, you might shy away from an almost political cartoon level of setup where an evil businessman is pouring pollution into the water while a teddy bear stands by crying. Instead, you can simply show how nice it would be to have less industrialization in the world, or a setting that's calm and free of those things. In the same way that we tend to enjoy discovering music on our own versus someone else telling us that we're going to love it, your potential audience will enjoy connecting the dots on their own without you spelling things out. That's what good humor does, and explaining the punchline lessens it. In order to cause someone to feel like this work reflects or supports that part of their identity that fits their aesthetic, leaving that room for them to connect the dots strengthens the process. For number three, one thing that's helpful but don't necessarily overthink or overvalue it is genre. Genre is simply organizing familiarity. Rango and Once Upon a Time in the West are both westerns with some similar trappings but drastically different intents and meanings and therefore very different aesthetics. Genre might be something that initially attracts someone to your work because of that familiarity, but you'll need to strike a stronger chord with them to get them to stay. Of course, there are people who are just into all westerns and only westerns, but more people just appreciate a good piece of art or story, no matter the genre. Oftentimes, genre will be tied to certain technical limitations or eras or mediums. For example, when we talked about pixel art, that's representative of technical limitations of a certain time that we still use today because of its appeal, ease of use, and nostalgia. Westerns often employ horses because planes weren't invented yet. I was just seeing if you were paying attention. Adopting the trappings, common elements, and familiar things associated with a genre draws work like a magnet towards certain aesthetics and helps tie it to something that people recognize. If you're building a personal aesthetic or are trying to strengthen something that's unique to you, see what ways you can anchor or ground your work by tying it to things common in a genre. Sometimes all you need is that specificity. For number four, this might be a little obvious, especially given what we've already talked about with theme, but consistency is a huge factor in establishing an aesthetic. Speaking of music, how many times have you heard one song by an artist only to find that none of their other music really sounds that way? Someone might be drawn to an individual piece of your work for any given reason, but turned away once they see that overall, your work is a smattering of way too much stuff without any unifying factors. We'll use the Instagram page as an example since it's sort of the purest form of this. You can think of a portfolio instead if you want. But if you went to someone's profile after seeing a really cool creature design, only to find the rest of their work is consistently post-apocalyptic vehicles, or even less consistent, their work is just all over the place without any real through line, you're probably less likely to follow them. This shouldn't limit you, and adhering to specific consistent elements just for the sake of it might even stifle your creative growth. But if it feels like there isn't a general vibe that people could describe your work with, it might help to hone things down a bit or try to specialize a little more. 
Number five is color, and this one's a little tough for a few reasons. First of all, color is based on value, how light or dark something is. And choosing local colors for things in something like an illustration, without thinking about value or what it does for the image, can make for just a really poor look. Using color in illustrations or in comics is not the same as picking colors for a logo. They're far more relative. But in terms of something like branding and the way that you typically render things, that same idea of the super cohesive Instagram page is really appealing and usually makes someone recognize that a piece of art was made by you before confirming that it is. For me, I don't really limit myself to a set palette, but in doing some exploration, I found that some of the colors I use the most in characters and the ones that appeal to me the most are this light yellow, bright orange, pale green, pastel pink, and of course, magenta skewed purple. Looking at these colors altogether gives me a strong feeling of meaning. It makes me feel like, yeah, my work is going in the direction that I'm hoping for. For someone observing it, hopefully a similar amount of that feeling comes across if they connect with it. For number six, this might seem minor, but composition actually contributes a lot to an aesthetic, just the same way that it does in, say, interior design. There's a very different feeling between the maximalist, gaudy, and cluttered walls of Buca di Beppo and a stark, minimalist apartment with maybe a piece of furniture and one picture on the wall. Look at the difference between an Instagram profile, or going back to that again, with the same character art being presented minimally and presented in a cluttered frenzy. This will come back to the method and process you're using while making work. Are you trying to fill in every space or do you want to let it breathe? That's going to contribute to an aesthetic just as much. Keep in mind that aesthetic being tied so much to personal identity means that you're going to alienate or put off just as many people as you are attracting to your work. And that's actually really good. It's the age old thing of instead of trying to appeal to everybody and resonating with no one, you're trying to hone down to a niche group who will really appreciate and subsequently support your work. I don't think you should be hyper-focused on creating things that adhere to a specific aesthetic. More like every couple of months or years, look at your work overall and see if you're steering in the right direction. So I'm curious, how would you describe your aesthetic? Either what you make or what you like. Why do you think it matters so much to you? And if you're an artist, are there things you'd like to change or improve? This month, there is a Deputy Timekeeper Future Time Criminal foil trading card and Goodwin hard enamel pin in Biko's backpack. You can get that over on patreon.com slash bageldenison, and you can get my course Learn Character Design at learncharacterdesign.com. My uh, social stuff is all at bageldenison, including Instagram, which I've neglected for far too long, and we'll be posting more on there soon. The, the aesthetic is not as strong as it once was because there's like a couple little announcement posts. I, I, don't, I don't like it. I, I gotta fix it, and then I prolong it longer. Anyway, thanks for watching, and have fun creating.